Okay, uh, ready to get started? Uh, start with a quick recap of what we talked about yesterday. <coughs> so, the purpose of Nix is to have repeatable builds and that the results of those builds should be easy to copy from one machine to another. And then the way Nix accomplishes this is with the core idea that everything lives in the Nix store and its path in the Nix store is a hash of its build inputs. Uh, so yesterday we showed how to launch an EC2 instance, uh, starting from minimal NixOS config using the user data feature, and then how to update that NixOS and deploy a new, new uh, configuration to it using the deploy script that we walked through yesterday. And then uh, our Haskell project setup looked like uh, a normal Haskell project with a Cabal file with the addition of a default.nix file that specified how we were going to build it with Nix and then a shell.nix file that specified how we were going to use the nix shell command um, to get a development environment to run things like GHCI. And so the nix command line tools that we've seen so far have been nix shell that we use for all our development tasks, uh, nix build, which we use when we just want to build a nix package, nix copy closure uh, was the way we copied a package from one machine to another, and then, uh, I guess we didn't actually talk about running this, but we briefly mentioned that nix collect garbage is the way to clean up old, unused paths in the nix store. Uh, and so far, we've been gradually building up a nix OS config for our server that has these three modules. The bootstrap file that contained our users and their authorized keys, um, the Scotty server that we ran, and then the nginx server that reverse proxies to it. Hi. So now I want to talk about a really cool feature of System D called activated sockets. Um, the reason for this is that there is a small problem with the approach that we've taken so far, which is that every time we launch a new NixOS config, every time we deploy, there's going to be a second or two while it's restarting that server, where if clients are hitting that web server, they're going to they're going to see this error message because nginx will still be running but there'll be a brief moment of downtime um, for our scotty server as we're launching the new one um, so searching for a, a solution to this problem is what led me to find out about this concept of socket activation um, so there's two kind of ways that systemd uses this phrase activation um, we talk about a program being socket activated or we talk about the sockets as being activated sockets. And I think one of those usages was seemingly sort of a mistake, but both of them are kind of in the common parlance. Um, the original purpose of activated sockets was actually to give us a way to start services in the right order when you're booting a machine. Because um, you have a lot of services that are depending on each other and some, um, some, some communicate with each other, with each other through sockets, right? Um, and so if, uh, if I have two services that are starting during boot and then one needs to make a request to another service, then we were in a situation for a long time where our boots were unnecessarily slow because we had to wait for our, this one service to start launching before we could launch the second service. Um, and there wasn't really a need for this because the only thing we were actually waiting on was for that socket to be available. So systemd's approach to this was, we, uh, they said, all right, just, just declare what, what sockets you're going to need, um, and systemd will start the sockets for you, and then just hand them off to your process. And then the, the cool feature that came along with this was you don't even need to necessarily declare all the service dependencies. Um, in order to determine when the services will be started by systemd, what it'll do is, if you've declared that your service has an activated socket that it needs, it'll just go ahead and create that socket, and then whenever any incoming traffic comes in, like whenever a client tries to connect to our server, it, it, it can wait to start our server until a client actually shows up to connect, so we don't actually have to start services until they're actually used. Um, we don't really care about that feature right now, um, what we care about is kind of a nice side effect of this whole system, which is that since the sockets are independent from the actual services that are listening on them, the socket can stay up even while the service is restarting. And so when our web clients are trying to connect to our server while it's restarting, 
instead of getting this error page, they're just going to get a moment or two of latency because their request will still, a socket is essentially like a queue of requests, right, or of messages. Um, so the, that HTTP request essentially will just sit in the socket until our server is ready to come back up and handle it. So we can, we can essentially deploy it here with zero downtime. The way we're going to do this is, so this is a modification of our previous NixOS uh, module. Um, the, the main addition here is we've added this block at the end here that, that defines a socket. Um, so like we, ha like we have in NixOS a, uh, a configuration object here called systemd.services, we have a corresponding one called systemd.sockets. And if you name a socket the same as thing as you name the server, so in this case we call this, we call this, uh, this unit party socket, and then we also call the socket party socket. And so that means that that socket is now associated with that service. Um, the, the socket declaration has the same, so we talked about wanted by before, how we wanted, um, how we, we say our service is wanted by the multi-user target, meaning when we pull up the multi-user environment, we want our service to come with it. We have a similar declaration here where our socket is wanted by the socket's target. Um, and pretty much every socket that you declare is going to have this line. So we're telling system D, all right, when it's time to bring up all the sockets, I want my socket to be included in that. And then the only other bit of config we need down here is to specify what's called listen stream, which is just the file path. Um, so this will be a what's called a Unix domain socket. So like everything else in Linux, it's a file. Um, so that's just a file path, and that can be anywhere. But under slash run is a conventional place for that. Um, and then the only other thing that we modified up here was we specified that um, that our service here requires that socket. Um, so we, we, we don't want to start that service until that socket is up. So I've said that, uh, I've said that system agree, systemd creates the socket for us and hands it to our program. I haven't specified yet uh, the mechanism by which it hands it and how in our Haskell code we can actually start using that socket. Turns out it's actually stunningly easy. Um, there's, a, there's a Haskell package called socket activation, um, and it contains this module with exactly one function in it, or one action, called get activated sockets. It's an IO action, and it returns maybe a list of socket. Um, the maybe is because the program might not be socket, socket activated at all if we weren't using this feature and tried to call this action, then we would just get a nothing there. Um, and then if we, if we are a socket activated program, then we'll get a just and a list of all the sockets that we've been activated with, which should just be one in our case because of how we configured it with exactly one socket. Um, just to emphasize sort of how simple this actually is, it's not even complicated under the hood. Um, so this is what the implementation of this function looks like roughly in that library. Um, the details aren't too important here, but uh, the process is based on these two environment variables, listen PID and listen FDs, where FD just stands for file descriptor. Um, so listen PID simply says uh, this is this is the PID that I'm the the, the process ID um, that systemd is trying to pass these sockets to. So here we use guard to make sure that we're only considering this program to be socket activated if the listen PID was our PID the the current the, the ID of the currently running process. Um, and then listen file descriptors is just a number that tells us how many sockets we've been activated with. Um, so then we'll, we'll just eventually turn these into sockets. Oh, but a socket is really just a new type wrapper around an integer, around a file descriptor. OK, so then how are we actually going to modify our Scotty example so that it uses this socket instead of listening on port to open its own listen socket? Um, so from the Scotty API, we have a handful of ways that we can run a Scotty server. Uh, the one that we used uh, at the top here is the most common one, where we just give it a port and then the description of our server, and then it runs. 
We also have uh, the, the fancier version of this is Scotty Opts, where instead of just a port, we give it this data type called options, which lets us specify a whole lot of other options to pass to Scotty. Uh, and then we have the final super sophisticated version of it at the bottom that we're going to use here, which is in addition to those things, we're going to actually pass it what socket we want it to listen on. So, so we've, we've shown how we're going to use the get activated sockets function to actually get that socket. Now the question is, what value do we need to pass it for the options? Um, clearly, since before we didn't have to specify any options when we just called this function, clearly we can infer from this that Scotty has a concept of there's some default options that's gonna that it's going to use uh, if you call Scotty instead of Scotty Ops. Right? Unfortunately, Scotty has neglected to provide us a similar thing for socket. Um, so we have, to, we have to call the function that requires an options uh, explicitly. Now, it doesn't immediately appear that there's any way in the Scotty API here to get what the default options are. Um, does, anyone, does anyone happen to be able to read this and... Um, be able to see how to, oh, I know you know. <laughs> uh, what, what, what function we could call here uh, to get the default options that we should pass there? OK, good. <laughs> and I can teach you something. Uh, <laughs> So a very easy to overlook thing when you're looking at the API documentation is the type class instance list for a type. So in this case, we want to know something about options. We really should look at the instance list. And we see that it has an instance of this class called default. So if we go in and look at what default is, default is a type class that provides one method. It's called def, just an abbreviation for default that gives us whatever the default value for the type is. Um, this is perhaps a disconcerting type class if you want to think about type classes as being algebras, because this is not uh, at least not an interesting algebra. Uh, there's no particular uh, you know, rule for what uh, the default, I don't know, what is the default character? What is the default integer? Um, but people, people mainly like it because it's conventional. Um, it's, a, it's just a typical way to, a typical thing to reach for because there's a lot of cases with configuration option records like this where you just want a, a default value. Um, so the way I'm going to use this is just with the type applications extension um, because I don't like this excessive polymorphism. So I'm going to use type applications here and specify uh, in this expression when I use it that I want this default to resolve to, uh, to a Scotty options value. OK, one more library we're going to need. We're just piling on Haskell dependencies here now, um, is, is the network library. It provides a lot of low-level network utilities. Um, that's where the socket type is defined. Um, and also the, the thing we're going to need it for here is we need to set the socket into non-blocking mode on Unix. Um, I don't really particularly care to go into the details of what that means. Uh, it, it just should suffice to say that when systemd gives us this, this socket, um, it, is not in, it is in blocking mode, not non-blocking mode. And when Scotty consumes it, it's going to want a socket that's in non-blocking mode. So we just need to call these two functions. We need to we need FD socket to convert the socket into a file descriptor, and then we need this set non block if needed to um, take this file descriptor and change its blocking mode. And okay, so finally, these are all the imports we just talked about, and some of the ones we had before. Um, we can see what our main node looks like in our in our socket activated server. So this is just the same as the server we had before, um, but in this case we've added a little bit to get the socket. So we call the get activated sockets function, and then we might have some sockets, and then we pattern match over that. 
Uh, and the three cases I really care about in order to provide decent error messages here are uh, the good case, where we got exactly one socket out of this, um, and then two bad cases. One where we got some sockets, but it's the wrong number, so I'm going to print that we got the wrong number of sockets, and then one in which we get nothing, which meant that we are not socket activated. Um, and it's uh, pretty, pretty common in a main like this when you're checking preconditions for the program to use this die function. Um, die will just print that string and then exit with uh, an exit code that indicates failure. Um, and then within the success case, what we've done then is um, we did just, just the two things I said before. First, we set up the socket into non-blocking mode, and then we run the Scotty socket function that starts serving. Uh, another thing we, that we could have done here, just to give you ideas, is uh, if we want to make a more flexible server that could either serve on a port or an activated socket, then what we could have done in the nothing case is just run the other Scotty function that we did before and serve on a port. Yeah, so now our server.nix file is growing. Uh, we've added to the module list here. In addition to the party Scotty server, now we have this party socket server. Um, and then this was this was the line that I accidentally left out the other day that we needed at the bottom here uh, to add the monadic party user that our servers are running under. And then this is the same nginx configuration that we had before, except I'm adding one more line to the bottom now. Um, now under the slash socket URL, we're gonna we're gonna serve on um, we're gonna we're gonna reverse proxy not to localhost in a port, but to that particular socket URL or not URL but file path. Um, and you can see this uh, the format for this that nginx requires is a little bit odd. Um, we start with we start with the same HTTP colon slash slash, but then we have to add Unix colon in front of it, and then we give it the path. Um, another thing you might be curious about when you're serve, running servers on Unix sockets is uh, how to how to debug them. Can I use can I use curl, for instance, on my server? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. In fact, curl a Unix socket. Um, so the syntax there is just curl dash dash unit socket and then the path that you want to make a request to. Um, and then an oddity here that curl requires a posi positional argument that is a URL. Um, when you're making a request to a Unix socket, there really isn't a URL, right? Because the URL consists of a server name and then, a, and then a path. And there is no server name here because we're just going to the file. To, we're going directly to the socket. Uh, so this where I've written dummy domain can be absolutely anything, but there has to be something there in order for curl to work. And then slash socket was the, the URL that we're requesting on that web server. Okay, now uh, switching switching topic a little. Here people talk about pinning a lot. So yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you know if you can specify the port to system D where it should listen on with the sockets, or is it really intended? You have a proxy. So can, can you get uh, system D to listen on like port eighty and port everything to your Unix socket, or do you need nginx in front of it? I think you need nginx in front of it. I don't. I'm not certain on that, but I don't think uh, I don't think system deactivated sockets can listen on a port. All right. I might be wrong though. All right. <laughs> okay. So we said the whole point of this, or a large point of it, was to have reproducible builds. Um, that's not entirely true with what I've given you right now, because you'll notice there's a piece of the environment that is not pinned down, is not fixed. And that was, we had a lot of points where we were saying import Nix packages, and we were saying we're going to import all of the Nix package set. Um, well, the Nix package set is changing all the time, right? People are adding packages to it, people are submitting bug fixes and security fixes and so on. Um, so what we need to do to fix that is just whenever we're running a build, we need to specify exactly what version of the package set that we're going to use. Um, 
So what, uh, when, we, when we used this, uh, this angle bracket syntax to, to refer to a path, what that was referring to is something on our Nix path. And Nix path is an environment variable uh, sort of named after path, right, in the same sort of, uh, same sort of purpose to look, to look stuff up in. Uh, if you use the Nix channel utility, um, that, that is a command line utility that's designed to set up a Nix path that lives under this, uh, uh, under this path, Nix def expert channels. Um, so the way this angle bracket gets resolved in, in the basic case is if I, if I write angle brackets Nix packages, then that refers to the file path uh, under the Nix path environment variable, a directory called Nix packages. And then if I do, for instance, uh, when we built the server, we called it nix packages slash nix os, and that just refers to one directory down. So if I run nix channel dash dash update, what that'll do is that'll update, uh, that'll update my nix package set to the latest version. And now when we deploy, we might be deploying something slightly different. Um, yeah, I don't care to talk about the detail. So this is why a lot of Nix-related projects, you'll find a file called nixpackages.nix in them, um, which will look something like this. Um, we can, what we're doing here is actually treating the entire Nix package set, the source code for it, as a Nix package itself. Um, so I'm starting with importing the, the default Nix packages from your environment, and then calling the fetch from GitHub function um, because the because it's uh, Nix, Nix packages lives in a in a repository on GitHub, um, so we can we can just fetch using their mechanism there. Uh, and I, I have this comment at the top to remind us how we came up with this with this uh, with this hash. So there's another Nix utility called Nix prefetch URL. Um, where we give it the name of a file. Um, so in this case, that file, if we, if we put this git commit revision um, in, into here, then we'll get a URL that we can download the Nix package set from. And then when we run this, what Nix prefetch pre URL will do is fetch that path, put it in the Nix store, and then spit out the hash that we needed to copy into here. Um, so this current revision is NixOS, NixOS 1803 that I updated in March. If we wanted to get a more recent version of that, we would go look up what the latest commit was in, in the Nix packages repository, uh, run this command, and then copy the hash into here. So there's a couple of ways that we could choose to actually use this pinned package set. Um, I think the simplest one is just to, uh, in our deploy script, we'll just set the NixPath environment variable to what, that, um, to what that is. So these were the steps that we had in the deploy script last time. I'm going to add two steps to the top here. Um, one, we'll, we're going to run uh, nix build on, on that nixpackages.nix file um, to get the to get the pinned version of the Nix packages set that we're going to use. Um, and then the next line is going to just set the Nix path environment variable. Again, I'm going to add a new type because I really like new typing text. Um, so the git Nix packages function is going to look almost identical to our build function earlier. We're just calling Nix build again. And this time, instead of server.nix, we're going to call Nix packages.nix. Um, so again, what we do is we run that, we get a single line out of it and convert it to text and wrap it up in the new type wrapper. Uh, and then in order to set the next path, we're gonna introduce one new function from the turtle library called export. Um, and export is named after the exact same thing in bash. It just sets an environment variable. Um, so we're setting the environment variable called next path. Um, and then we're setting it to specify that when we refer to angle brackets Nix packages, we want the path that we're passing in. Okay, so that was our, that was the end of our diversion into pinning. Um, does that make any sense? Is there any questions on uh, why why we pin or how? Hmm. 
Sir? That's what you're pinned. You don't want to be having the keeper. You want to have reproducible uh, pins all the time. Right. <laughs> You have to update, so to get security updates, yeah. you need to update the version that you had pinned, right? Is there like a mailing list or a way to learn about security updates? Is there a package that you know? Hmm. I don't think there's a great answer to that in terms of getting updates. Um, so uh, today's apology for the state of the Nix community will be that it is not quite that mature, right? Uh, and, and, and the other thing, the other thing I should warn that it's not entirely mature about is um, security updates really are only guaranteed for the current latest release. Um, so you really, uh, NixOS releases are every six months is a new stable release. Um, so, and they're, they're named after, the one we're using now is 1803, meaning it's from January, February, March, March of 2018. Um, so the most the previous one to that was 1709 from September of 2017, um, and NixOS uh, NixOS 1803 is getting security patches to it. NixOS 1709 is not, as far as I know. So, um, in general, the NixOS community still needs to grow a bit more before we can say that the security patch story is truly reliable. Um, Yeah, a version of NixOS is um, it's corresponds to a branch in the Nix packages repository. Right. Um, so it's not it's not a particular commit, right? But um, as fixes get added to it, right, that branch head moves. Good. Okay, so uh, the next topic I want to talk about uh, is how we do logging on our servers. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think this is going to be kind of a boring topic because I think logging should be a pretty boring topic, but it should be a short topic. Um, my, my philosophy here is logging desperately needs to be kept as simple as possible. I don't want any complicated logging frameworks. I just want to be able to write messages that I'm going to be able to find at a later time. Um, I think I wanted to talk about this here because I think the logging situation in Haskell sort of seems nebulous because no one talks about it because it's not that complicated. It's the kind of has typical Haskell problem where our successes disappear uh, and if something is not a difficult problem then we don't end up talking about it very much and then no one who's getting into it knows how to do it. Um, so my approach here is just going to be we're going to write we're going to write single lines of text to the standard output stream. Uh, and since our services are started by systemd, that means that that will end up being collected by uh, a piece of systemd called journaldd. Um, and then to, to view that, if you, if you log into your server and run journalctl-f, you can follow that log um, and see the log output in real time. If you want to look at the log output for a particular service, like our demo here is going to be called uh, party count. Um, then you can use dash u and specify the, what service you want to see the log output from. Um, so the only caveat to what I said about wanting to keep the logging <laughs> as simple as possible was that in a situation where we're running multiple threads, as we're going to be doing with Scotty, um, because Scotty is going to be using multiple threads under the hood, we don't want to just use the put sterlin command. Um, because then our log our logging output is going to end up interleaved, right? If we don't have some some way to to lock on the standard output stream. Um, so for that, I'm going to introduce um, my typical tiny logging framework um, that doesn't even exist in a package. It's just such a small amount of code, and it will have three operations here. Uh, one will create the log handle, and we'll do this once in main, and then just pass it around to any, anything that needs to do logging. We'll, we'll have a write to log function uh, that just takes this, the, oops, that takes the text that we want to print and just prints it. Um, and then finally, we'll have this run logger action, which will run in a separate 
thread and be the thing that actually prints to the output stream. Um, now, uh, a quick observation about the, the type that I've written here for run logger. Um, does, anyone, does anyone notice anything odd about this type? So what it produces, yeah. So it produces value, All right? So, I mean, every every IO action produces value, right? So like write to log produced unit, yeah. But but here we're producing a. So so what is that a? But the question is, what could that A possibly be? Because that A is universally quantified here, right? So what it looks like I'm writing here is that I have an IO action that can return anything you ask for. I think that's, yeah. Um, I think you could call it a phantom type. I always forget sort of what people mean when they say phantom type. Right. OK, so um, I mean, so the, so the answer to this is that in general, we know that we can't just produce a value out of thin air of any type that you ask for, right? I mean, um, for instance, the void type doesn't even have any inhabitants. So if we instant, so we could, we could make this compile in a situation where A specializes to void. Right. So, what, what I'm trying to get at that we can infer when you see a type like this is that this IO action is never going to return anything, which means it's never going to terminate. So run longer simply just runs forever. Uh, so that's the takeaway here. It could terminate in an exception, um, but when you, when you see type variables in the output that just sort of come out of nowhere, um, that means that they're, they're fake. They're never actually going to happen. Right? And parametricity guarantees this, that this IO action is never going to terminate normally. Um, so yeah, we're using, using STM here. Um, the fact that we're using STM here isn't actually important um, to this particular example. What's important is just that I wanted a queue. Um, and so STM provides us with a queue. So what a, what a log handle simply will be is a is a wrapper around a uh, a, a queue of of text values, um, which they call a channel. Uh, and then we can see what we're importing here is uh, in addition to the channel type, just the operations the, that the STM channel gives us, which is the ability new tchan.io creates a new channel. Read um, will uh, pop an element off of the queue if there is one available, otherwise block. Um, and then write will add a new log to the queue. And this is the, the queue of log messages that need to be printed but have not yet been printed to the output. Um, so the, the advantage of using a queue rather than like a, you could, you could think of using a mutex, right? Um, so we get, uh, we, get, we, we, get, we get less contention if we use a queue, right? Because um, I don't have to wait for all the previous log messages to print. If I want to write one, um, I can just throw it in the queue and move on, and it will get printed eventually, hopefully. Creating a new log is quite trivial here. Uh, we just create a new channel, and then we wrap that channel up in our log handle type. Writing to the log, also very simple. Um, we just use the write to channel function. And then because this is STM, we're wrapping it up in the atomically function to convert that from being in the STM monad into the IO monad. And then what we do in run logger is we use this forever function from control.monad 
And so what forever does is it takes an action and then just loops it indefinitely. Um, and so what we do in, within this loop is read from the channel and get a message and then print that message. And that is the extent of our logging framework. Uh, and so then what I said is that we were going to run this uh, run logger function in a separate thread. So now I have to explain how to do that. Fortunately, um, we also have an incredibly concise um, API in the async package um, that will let us run things concurrently. Um, and it is called concurrently. Um, so we give it one thing, and then another thing, and then it gives us an action that is do both of those things at the same time. Um, and so when, when you use this kind of approach with this kind of logger, this is what your main looks like. Um, skipping over this first line for a second, first thing we'll do is create the log. And then we will concurrently run the logger and run the server. Um, and presumably, I guess I should have actually passed the log handle also to whatever this run server is, because we don't have anything that's going to be using this log handle right now. Um, so what we did in the first line here was um, make sure that we set the standard output stream to be in line buffering mode. Um, so <laughs> there are a handful of buffering modes that a, um, that, uh, that, uh, that a Linux file descriptor can be in. Um, buffering refers to when I print something, when does, that, when does the characters that I printed actually end up at their destination, which is in this case the systemd journal. Um, so we can be in unbuffered mode, which means that every time we output a character, it's going directly to the output. Um, and we have buffered modes that are slightly more efficient. Um, so we have block buffering mode, I think it's called, um, which does, I don't know, just every so often, maybe a kilobyte or so, I don't know, um, that will we'll flush the buffer every so often. Um, we really want to be in line buffering mode here. Um, especially for our development servers anyway, because we want to see each line of output in the log as it comes out every line. Um, with, without this, it may look like your logging is not working because you might be printing something and nothing shows up in the log. Um, but maybe a few minutes later, a bunch of stuff will show up in the log. So line buffering mode saves you from that craziness. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so we have, um, we have about 15 minutes, I guess, left before lunch. I don't have anything else concrete uh, here in the slides. So um, I can probably spend most of the rest of the time um, showing you excerpts from our um, actual server that's that's employing these techniques um, if there's if there's any any requests um, for for topics um, things that seem concerning uh, I can address those too Oh yeah, do you actually you actually wanna want proof that this works? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's 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 actually walk through um walk through doing this. I can give you my uh network connection if that one doesn't work for you. Oh, I I don't know, I think it's good. Okay, so we started with uh with needing our bootstrap file, right? And then we go through this next OS process. Mm. 
<laughs> Sorry, I have to log in to AWS. And I have to do my two factor off. Fortunately, it's, you know, two factors, so it should be safe to show you one of the factors, right? <laughs> okay, so we're using this small, smallest instant type, or it's not the smallest, second smallest. All right, go down here under the advanced details, and I, wow, that is... Okay, so that is a config. Bump up these size. Okay, I'm gonna need to remember what port we used here for SSH and open that up. Okay, and now that will be, I don't know, probably about two minutes for this instance to launch. Oh, actually, I did have one more demo, I'm sorry. So just to show a basic example of a stateful server, I have a, just a page counter here. Um. And so we'll pull up the source code for that. All right, so we did, we did uh, everything up here that we've talked about before. We create a log handle. Um. And then to, to keep that count in a stateful place, uh, again, I'm using STM, we could use an MVAR. But, uh, so this, this, this creates a, a mutable variable here. Um, so the type here is going to be uh, a TVAR of int, I think. Or no, I use natural. Has everybody seen what the natural type is? <coughs> It's a slight improvement on integer in the fact that it excludes the negatives. Uh, so we're starting on zero here and counting up. So we'll exclude a source of bugs um, if our count somehow were to become negative. Um, we have an assurance here that it cannot be. That's an exception. <laughs> so then you have a server crash instead of the wrong thing on the stage. Yes, but it'll crash sooner than. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I mean, this is a. Nat natural shows you one of the pitfalls of the num type class, right? Um, Nat a natural type really shouldn't have a general subtraction method, all right? but it does simply because it belongs to this num class in base, um, which is um, a little more specific than it should be to describe numbers in general. Um, 
So we end up with a subtraction function that's partial. Uh, oh, I guess I wrote this one slightly differently in this code than I did on the slide. Uh, so this we could have written just the same as using this concurrently like this. That and that. OK, so concurrently that we used on the slide, here's a function that takes the two arguments that we want to run. Um, we can do a, a more, more general thing um, using this concurrently new type. And concurrently is cool because it's uh, one of the elusive examples of something that is an applicative but not a monad. Make sure I got that right. Yes, concurrently. So concurrently is just a new type wrapper around I.O., um, but with a different applicative instance. Um, so when I, <coughs> if I were to take out the concurrently wrapper and just run two things and just run, um, sorry, one action and then, an then another, by default with I.O., that means I'm going to run this and then this afterward, right? I should have taken up this concurrently. But when I'm, when I'm composing these using the applicative operator and I'm in the concurrently applicative, um, then the semantics of this is, um, is, to, is to run them at the same time. Um, so is it, uh, is it immediately obvious why concurrently could not have a monad instance? All right, because, because this really gets at the essence of what monad actually is, right? Monad is the type class for things that can be sequenced. Um, and so kind of by definition, if I'm doing two things at the same time, I can't do them in sequence. Oh, so that's why, <laughs> that's how it ended up on my slides, that I wasn't passing log handle into run server, because run server was defined up here in my code. Um, so it already just has a reference to log handle, because it's defined in the same function. Um, oh, but I did pass the log handle here to my Scotty app. Um, so let me move, move this logging framework to the bottom. So when I define my Scotty application now, uh, instead of this just being a value in the Scotty monad like we did before, now it's a function that takes in some, uh, some dependencies that we had. Um, so our application is now parameterized on the log handle and on the state. So then there are three things that I do here. Um, first, I increment the counter and get the value that we're going to display for the, for the new counter. Um, then I, I log that value to the log. Um, and then I output what you've, what you've seen over here. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people are viewing this. No. <laughs> um, and we've used, <laughs> you know, I mentioned, I introduced the neat interpolation package as a way just to write multi line strings in Haskell. Um, the reason it's called neat interpolation is because it has this feature that's also called interpolation. Um, so I, if I have the dollar sign and then a value here, um, within this quasi code environment, it actually takes the value of this. And the, this has type of text, and substitutes it right in here, so I can build up strings without having to concatenate them together, which is really convenient. Hmm. 
So what we're doing here then is um, we've we've we have several different monad types to convert through. Um, so the actual the the interesting action in this function that updates the value of that tvar is in the stm monad. Um, we used atomically to convert that into an IO action, um, just like we did before in the write to log function. And then we need a further thing because we're actually in the Scotty action M. So I could I could annotate this whole thing if I wanted to. In fact, I should really just make this explicit and pull it out into a separate thing. So we could call this, for instance, the, the count action. So that'll take all the same arguments that the entire server definition had, uh, except now we're going to be in the Scotty action monad. Uh, so to, to remind you, the action monad specifies what happens when you've actually um, when you've matched that path, and now you're handling this request. Uh, so what the lift and catch IO function does is it will just take an IO action and lift it uh, into the um, into the Scotty action monad. Um, and if that IO throws an exception, um, then we're not going to throw an exception that catch catches our that crashes our program. Uh, this is called lift and catch IO because Scotty will catch that exception um, and handle it and return a HTTP 500 error. And is that our cue that it's lunchtime? Because I think that's a good point. <laughs> OK, um, so now I just want to kind of run through the, um, the code that I am actually running in production. Um, so this has been a project that's been going on for, I don't know, about six months now, maybe, working on the server. Um, so I don't know, uh, run through just some of the some of the lessons learned and some of the things I've used in building it. Um, Okay, so this is our server config. Um, you can see it's, it's got a lot of the same uh, kind of boilerplate here. I don't have this one broken up into multiple modules as I did here. I just uh, I started learning how to do that for the sake of presenting this. Um, so this being my first project, I didn't really know how to break it into modules at the time when I wrote it. Um, so the, uh, the, the website that we're talking about here, if I can take a moment to chill for my own products, uh, is typeplasticist.com. Um, this is a really a pretty basic static website. Um, the, the, the only thing that it needs to really do is um, support payments. And so when people are subscribers, it needs to show them different content. Um, yeah, most everything is static except for just the uh, like the account management pages. And the, so we have the typical kind of subscribe, log in, log out workflow. Um, so I, I split this up into multiple server processes. Um, part of the part of the motivation for this was just um, people people talk a lot in performance about memory leaks in Haskell. And although I have not yet run into any in production, as far as I can tell, um, I was sort of scared of that concern <laughs> and trying to figure out how to um, pinpoint any if I had them. 
And so I figured splitting it up into as many surfaces as possible, I would be able to uh, have a better chance at identifying the culprit of anything if I have. Um, So one one maybe interesting thing about the way I did this is um, all these processes are actually the same executable. Um, this is I got this idea from actually the way the um, so the 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 your your basic uh, Linux utilities like uh, cat and CP and MV and some others. Um, if you look into how those work, those are actually just er, in some Linux distributions, but in NixOS, those are actually all just symlinks to the same executable. And then what happens when you run them is they look at their program name to determine what behavior they should have. Um, so yeah, I, I stumbled onto that fact by accident one day and then went looking up why they did it. Um, and it's because they can get better, better memory usage, better caching behavior, I guess, um, because hmm, do you have a better explanation for why that is? <laughs> I think it's like a storage kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Multiple ex executables weigh more than one. Uh, that would be my bet. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, so because, because all those executables are going to share some libraries, right? And so if it's all one executable, then the total disk space is lower. Yeah. And um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way memory works too is that when all those processes are running simultaneously, they can actually share virtually mapped pages in memory. Is you nodding <laughs> close enough to true? <laughs> um, so if we look at the main here, uh, so this is this is our main function for all of the services that we're running. Um, so in uh, the system.environment module in base, you've got a function called git progname. Um, so that corresponds to the, uh, in bash scripts, that's dollar sign zero. Right? It's the name of the program that got executed. Um, and so, so depending on what we've, um, how we've called the program, then I call them the different main functions from each module that I've imported. Uh, another sort of lesson learned here was initially I went through and uh, for each of those mains I was using the optparse applicative package and doing some command line argument parsing um, because it was really easy to drop configuration things right into this string interpolation string in, in each of the exec start scripts. Um, in the end, in the end, I I decided against that, and in in what we're doing right now is I'm passing a single command line argument, um, which is just an INI file, uh, which I define up here. Um, so, th and this is just a file that contains all of the configuration that that all the servers need. Um, the really the motivation for this was just when I'm defining services, when I'm defining processes that are only ever going to run on the server and I'm never going to actually call them by typing in commands on the command line, um, there's just a lot more code that you need to write in order to do command line argument parsing. And parsing an INI file is just dead simple. Um. The package I used for that parsing was called config I and I. Where do I use that? Uh, and so in my project, I've got a module called config that just does all the I and I related parsing. Um, So the way this library works is pretty clever. You actually define uh, instances of this INI parser type. Um, so in this case, this is this uh, squirrel here is my uh, my INI parser for the the Postgres connection info. Um, so we do this we do this by first uh, creating here is a is a parser of just an individual section. 
and then when we wrap that in the config dot section um, function, then we then we convert that into something that parses a, a, a piece of an INI file uh, under the section heading Postgres. So then, in so this is the main for uh, the the server that serves most of the just static pages, um, or actually no, all of the, all of the pages. Um, so I've broken it down into, for instance, like one of the servers serves all handles all the GET requests, and one of the servers handles all the POST requests, and so this is the one that handles the GETs. Um. And so here we just take, um, to, to, to read these things from the INI file, we just compose the parsers that we defined in that INI module. Um, so each of these lines here is a, is a parser that was defined in that module. And then we compose them all just as a giant tuple. Um, there was another thing that I simplified over time. Um, at, at first, my impulse was really to, in each of these mains, I was defining some, some, some big record type called options, All right? Because I just wanted to, I don't know. It was just how I thought of it, right? I was just doing a piece at a time. I want my parser to give me all of my command line options, and then I want to run my program with those options. And so I would have you know, a, 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 a thing for each value. Um, that ended up just being overkill. And I really recommend just parsing everything into a giant tuple, because your main is most likely the only function that is ever going to use all of the arguments. Right? You're never going to pass around all of the options. Um, and so being able to just uh, take advantage of the, this giant tuple function. <laughs> Oh, should I should I explain what this what this is that I have highlighted? Is this frightening to anyone? Can, can someone tell me what this function is that's highlighted? <laughs> yeah. So that's <laughs> the it's um. I forget if I had to turn on an extension to do that. No, I don't think so. No, it, it doesn't take tuple sections. No, because it's not a section. Right. Yeah, so this is this is the this is the shorthand for the tuple constructor, right? So this I'll shorten it to make it more obvious, right? This this has the type of um, a to b to c to, and then gives you a tuple of the a and the b and the c. All right. <laughs> so following this traditional pl applicative pattern, at first we fmap this over the over one of these parsers, um, then we get um, then we get a parser for a tuple constructor with one fewer element, and then as we proceed to the rest of them, then we fill them in. So if we were to then you know add um, some other additional parser here, then we would just have to add another comma up here, because now we're building a bigger tuple. <laughs> Is that sarcasm or no? I don't know. <laughs> I think I would go for a record. For, what, for a record? For a record, yeah. Mm. Then, uh, <laughs> How do you remember which, which position switch? Well, they're right next to each other. <laughs> Right, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do this if I were ever passing that tuple around, and if I ever had to understand it in a file that wasn't right next to where it was defined. Right, so yeah, I, big positional things are scary to me unless they're just going, you know, from one thing just to the line previous, and then I can just sort of count. <laughs> What 
else am I talking about? Oh yeah, so there were a couple things um, that I had to address because I specifically didn't want to use a larger web framework like you sewed. Um, so in in my in my sort of perpetual drive for simplicity and in being able to understand the entire system, um, I, I I really wanted to view the web server as you know, why do I really need a complicated framework? Web server is mostly just a mapping from requests to responses, right? So I should just be able to, to do that. Um, there are a few, a few kind of annoyances that I realized that are some reasons why web framework showed up. Um, some sort of cross-cutting concerns, I guess, that, that make you not just be able to write your web application as a mapping from requests to responses, um, so trivially anyway. Um, one is you think about, OK, if there's, if there's a, a 404, then I would like, for every path, right? I would like to be able to instead serve a nice looking 404 page and not just throw some kind of exception that the, that the web application server is going to catch. And, um, so it turns out there's actually a really nice way to do this with Nginx. Um, so, all I do is um, each of the individual Haskell servers that Nginx proxies to, I just let them crash with the default blank 500 page. And then in the Nginx config, Ah uh, yes, so I had a bit of um, a bit of config for nginx uh, that I've called fancy not found here um, that it will turn regular not found responses into fancy nice looking not found error messages. Uh, so we we can turn on the nginx feature called proxy intercept errors. Um, so that will that feature will kick on every time the um, every time we get a non success response from one of the things we're proxying to. And then I specify that the error page in the 404 case should be this not found location, which I've defined here. Um, and I'm, I'm, just using, uh, I'm just using regular old ports here and not the activated sockets, just because uh, I just discovered the activated sockets things pretty recently and haven't had time to actually put it into my server yet. But. So one of these servers is actually a dedicated server that just only serves 404 pages. So it just exists as to, to be the fallback for the other servers. Um, another reason I like, uh, one reason I like this approach is that um, if we look at what the 404 behavior actually does, um, what I've done is I don't just want to give you a page not found. I want to also just use this opportunity to help you. So it serves up a random Haskell tip each time you visit a 404 page. Um, so there's data then that had to be loaded into memory to do that, and I didn't want to load that. Um, you know, if I'm being extremely conservative about memory, because again, I want to shove everything into a gigabyte of, of RAM. Um, I don't want that data to be shared across the memory of all of my server processes, right? So it just gets to live in this one 404 server. The logging module also shows some remnants of uh, past decisions that I've then cut back on. Um, at the time, I was just following what I had seen everywhere else, and I had uh, more complicated types of log messages. For instance, I had log at the info level and log an error, and log an error with a stack trace. Um, and so then my log channel, my, my queue, then consisted of these various types. So I, the, this is a, an info level message and an error level message. Um, in, I don't know, in practice, none of this just seemed useful, and I really just wanted text. Uh. Okay, well, that's, 
That's that's a good tip. Maybe maybe we should do that then. Maybe <laughs> you uh, maybe that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So would we then have to specifically write to journal D? Like we wouldn't be able to use the standard output stream anymore. Uh, I think there is some format. Hmm. Some kind of JSON logging or something. <laughs> What else is interesting? Perhaps our Stripe webhook server is interesting. <laughs> oh dear, but there's lenses involved here. I don't want to show you lenses. Yeah, so the, the, the entire purpose of this server is just to receive the, uh, the webhook notifications that, that Stripe sends us for the payment processing events. Um, and so this is what that single uh, action M looks like. Yeah, the most interesting part of this to me was uh, what we had to do to um, to authenticate these requests. So what Stripe does so that not just anyone can hit your uh, webhook API endpoints is um, a lot of a lot of APIs like this will simply include a secret value in the request body um, that you can just check against it, um, against what you know the value ought to be. Stripe actually does something more complicated, and they include um, they include a signature of each request body signed with that secret value. Um, and so I could, did not find any little Haskell, Haskell library to do this already, so I had to write this myself here. Um, so we can see the, the, what, what we do here in, in this uh, request, it requires Stripe signature function, um, is I take, um, and, and oh, and Stripe also has um, two two modes that any request can come in as. It can come in as live mode or test mode. Um, so what I do is here is I, t I take here as an argument uh, what that webhook secret key is um, in both live mode and test mode. So. Um, yeah, so so we use the the Scotty dot body action, which returns you the entire uh, the entire request body as a lazy string builder, I guess, or lazy byte string. Uh, <coughs> so we first thing we do is LBS, I think, is defined up here, is uh, imported up here from is lazy byte string. Yeah. So if, and. You're uh, sort of perpetually going to be switching between byte strings and text and between lazy and strict when you do web stuff because the the web frameworks really don't um, they have no way of knowing which of them you you need to use. So at at the lowest level, the the really low level web servers are always going to give you lazy byte strings because that's just the the sort of most primitive, least assumptive thing you can do. Because as you receive a request, you're just going to receive that in chunks of bytes. Um, as, as you get to higher level things, Scotty tends to do a lot of things with either lazy or strict text. So we're mostly going to assume 
you know, it, it just makes your life easier if they assume UTF-8 everywhere and just give you text. Um, and it also can make your life easier if we just assume that the requests are going to be small so that we can just convert them to strict values, right? So instead of sort of a lazy stream of I.O., um, we just have the entire thing packed into one text value. Um, but in this case, this is a, a particularly low-level function in Scotty that just gives you the body. Um, so they, they give it to you as a lazy byte string. So we want to convert it to a strict byte string here because we know we're going to want to read the entire request body um, because we're going to need it um, to, to calculate what the, the signature ought to have been. Can you zoom in at just a Oh, sorry. Yeah. Quite small. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yes, and so the way the way Stripe makes you do this is you actually have to parse the JSON that's in the body and Oh no, we had to do that because uh, each each request body here is going to contain an attribute that tells you whether you're in uh, live mode or test mode, um, and so we have to parse this here because we have different uh, we have different different webhook secrets depending on where we're in web mode or test mode. So in order to verify this, we have to parse the body and figure that out. Um, so based on that, here it shows the, the webhook secret, um, and then we determine whether this body has a valid Stripe signature. And so um, this is just the, the way that Stripe specifies that you have to compute the signature. Um, uh, yeah, which is we, we so, OK, so we, we, we read the signature that they provided um, from, a, from, a he, from an HTTP header. So scotty.header gives us that. And how did we do this? Okay, did we okay, so that is we did we should the signature that they gave us. And then we do this to see if the signature is valid. Uh, so that's that's again the signature that they gave us, and we're checking to see if that byte string equals um, the yeah the the HMAC digest uh, of the secret, uh, the time that they provided, and and the request body. And so this is HMAC is a function from the Kryptonite library, which if you're doing Anything cryptography related in Haskell, you're going to be using Kryptonite. Um, they describe it as a yes, a repository of cryptographic primitives that strives to be a cryptographic kitchen sink, and it is. Yeah, so we're using, I think, I think that's the module they imported. Yeah. Ah, oh, yes, this is another annoyance that's worth mentioning. Um, so there is another package out there called CryptoHash that, specif that also specifies a module called Crypto.hash. And there's a lot of packages that still use it. Um, so sometimes if you're importing Crypto.hash, um, you're going to end up with a conflict because it, the GHC is not going to know which package to import that module from. Um, and so to work around situations where that might happen, um, we can use, uh, it's called the package imports GX, GHC extension. Um, so that enables this syntax where, uh, in addition, in the middle of our sort of normal import line, we have the string here, and that's the name of the package that we specifically want to import from. So if you have two packages that define the same module, that is a way you can get around that problem.
Oh yeah, so the, the behavior, um, the cookie-related behavior is another thing that I just uh, sort of decided to take some pain upon myself instead of using a web framework to handle. Um, so rather than, uh, rather, than have, rather than having this notion that a lot of web, web frameworks have where I should just sort of have an action to sort of draw request context out of the air, um, Anything that's going to require doing something different based upon like whether you're logged in or not um, just calls a function to get and parse the, the cookies uh, itself rather than just sort of hoping to have the framework provide it. Um, so and, uh, to, to avoid having to parse the whole cookie request header multiple times, um, I just have one data type here that's type classes cookies that defines all of the data um, that my application could possibly put into cookies or that cares cares about in the cookies. Um, so this this action down here called get type classes cookies um, just parses parses the entire cookie header in one go. So you can see that we use this in a lot of places. Oh yeah, so here's another fun place where uh, I had to use STM to do something. Um, so some of the some of the Stripe actions um, when we're doing things require mul making multiple requests to the Stripe API in in one sort of atomic operation, um, like to I think to see if to to determine whether. Uh, Customer is subscribed or not? I think I think we need to like first make a request to look up something about that customer, and then look up something about the subscription. Um, and so, in order to do that, then I didn't want uh, I didn't want multiple I didn't want multiple threads to ever be uh, making Stripe requests regarding relating to the same customer at the same time. Um, and so in order to do that, I don't know if this is a thing that already exists, but I made up this term called lock set, which is conceptually represents a, a, a lock, a, a, a mutex um, for each user ID. Um, so I use the, use the STM containers uh, package for this. Um, and what we have here is um, a lock set is simply a set set as uh, imported from STM containers. Um, so this is, I think, conceptually, you can think of this as um, as being like a, a tvar of a normal set, right? Or a, an, an mvar. Um, but uh, STM containers, I actually missed your talk on this that day. I assume you talked about why this is more more efficient than just using a TVR with a set in it. Yeah. Um, but it just gives you less contention, right? Um, so the way we, 
acquire a lock on a user ID when we're about to do something related to them for Stripe. Um, is So in this lock set acquire function, um, we acquire by, by looking. Uh, so the, the set is, is a set of user IDs that are locked, that someone is currently working on. Um, so we can look up in the set to see if this user ID is already locked. And if it is, then we'll wait until it's not. And then otherwise, we lock it by inserting that user ID into the set. And then later to release it, we call set.delete uh, and remove it from the set. Oh, I suppose we wanted to see. Um, so this was the instance that we set up just before lunch that it is now running. Um, so we should be able to shell into this and prove that it's actually working. Uh, we need to use we need to use our weird port. So this is sage dash p to specify the port. And I think that'll work. OK. So now if we look at something like system CTL status, we should be able to see what's running on it, which is basically nothing because we haven't configured it. So if we go back over uh, to our deploy script demo, and drop this IP address into our server address file, now we should I should be able to show you actually running that deploy script. I think I put in some uh, some print lines here that weren't in the in the slides, but now it, now it announces that it's building NixOS. And now it's compiling our Haskell. Now I've announced that we're uploading. As I've complained about before, Nix, Nix doesn't really uh, announce anything happily when it's done building. It just sort of finishes. OK, and so this is Nix copy closure running. And we can see each individual derivation that, it's, that it uploads. And because these packages are split up so granularly, um, this means that usually we're not really uploading very much because we only need to upload the packages that have actually changed. Hmm. Oh, here? OK, this was what I was mentioning on the first day regarding um, the, oops. Regarding, this is what the use substitutes flag does. So cache.nixos.org is the, is the cache for essentially everything that's in the Nix, Nix packages repository. Oh, they, they um, give you stuff. They do. Oh, yeah. I mean, OK. Thank you. Thank you, because I skipped over a huge advantage of, uh, of using Nix and using Nix to develop Haskell which is that if you're using the versions of, of Haskell libraries, I, mean, I say Haskell libraries especially because it's important because Haskell takes a while to compile, right? Um, 
if yeah, if if you don't change too many of the 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 Haskell dependency versions from the default that's in on the Nixos cache, um, then most of the time when you build your Haskell development environment, you really don't have to compile any of your Haskell dependencies at all. It'll just pull pre-built ones from the cache. Yeah. Um. OK, and then uh, the copying ended here, and then we activated starting here. Um, and then it tells us these are all the system D units that it stopped. Um, these are the ones that are not affected. Um, it actually does intelligently use uh, reload versus restart, I believe. Um, so that like if you if you try to ship a broken engine X configuration, I think it won't actually restart. It'll just reload it. Um, and so. Um, does, is that clear the difference between like, reloading and restarting a service? Should I explain that? <laughs> um, so so re restarting actually means I'm going to stop it and then start it again, um, which means you're going to have you know a moment where it's not responding, right? And it also means that if it's misconfigured, it's going to fail to come up, and now it's just dead. Uh, whereas things like Nginx support a concept of reloading the config while it's still running. Um, so I just change the config file and then send a signal to it that says, hey, read the new config file. Um, and then I think that's defined, uh, I think that is defined somewhere in the in the definition of the Nginx module that, that when you ship a new version, it um, has this behavior where it reloads. OK, and then uh, the last line is it tells us that it noticed we had these new units defined that weren't there before. Um, so these are all of our party services. Um, and notice that when we turned on the uh, enable Acme in our Nginx config, uh, that, that enabled some, some Acme services. Um, the, those are you know, responsible for updating your SSL cert that's generated with Let's Encrypt. So now if we come back over here and see, look at system CTL, CTL status, we should see, oh, something's wrong. Uh, but we see our servers running down here, or at least there's that one party count server, and there's party Scotty. Um, but our state is degraded, and we have one failed unit. Uh, Oh, that probably is what's failing, yeah. Because I haven't. This is a new machine, and I haven't set up the DNS for it, right? So the let's encrypt thing isn't going to work on here. Yeah. Um, I think if we just run systemctl, we should see a better list that makes it easier to see what's failed. And yes, good, good guess. The Acme service is what's failed. Actually, shell into my into my live server here. Uh, just to show you what the live log looks like. Don't tell anybody because it's probably a GDPR violation. No, in fact, yes, that's. <laughs> Let's not show that at all. So really, one of the things I wanted to show was what your SSHD logs look like if um, 
if you don't change the port as I have to a weird port here. Um, so pretty much everything in this in this log from the SSH server is is failed login attempts um, from botnets around the world. Uh, for various reasons. So some people are just guessing usernames and passwords, trying to log in as user and admin. Um, some people, I think, are uh, trying to log in with broken old crypto standards, I think. <laughs> um, so you would, think, you would think the botnets might be more clever than this and look for other ports, but in practice, they seem not to. So if you just don't serve on port 22, you can get cleaner log files. The DNS fix, if we wanted to fix that, um, it depends on what your DNS provider is. But if you're doing everything in AWS like I am, then uh, RAP53 is their DNS service. Um, so all we've done to set up Monadic Party is add a record here. Uh, it's called an A record um, that, that points a subdomain to a particular IP address. Um, so this was the, the IP address of the demo server that we had set up before. and then. Uh, if we wanted to fix this one, we could change it to the new IP address and make our SSL work again. So how does this feel? Is there any step of this that you feel like you couldn't do or still seems too mysterious? Can you show the database? Oh, yes. Um, so let's see. The database things are mostly just spread throughout the modules that use them in terms of uh, where my queries are. Uh, let's see what I put in here. Oh, yeah, for the, um, for the connection pool, I've used, uh, what is this, this resource pool package. Ah, yes, one of the Brian S. Sullivan packages. Small again, didn't we? Where is this database, database scheme defined? Uh, it's just a Postgres? Yeah, it's just Postgres. Oh, it's, it's not done in Postgres. No. Um, so that's, this is another, uh, another place where I've sort of gone for utter simplicity here. There's a lot of fancy um, database-related things that you can do in Haskell. And um, I've gone with the Postgres SQL simple library. So um, all I did was log in, use, use psql, and, and, and run my schema creation scripts to create my schema on my database. Um, and then all I do when I use this is write SQL. No, I don't. Um, I don't have a compelling reason not to exactly, other than I just wanted to not use something fancier until I felt like I needed it, and I haven't felt like I needed it yet. Um, so this is a. Uh, I guess your database is not that complicated. Yeah. Mm, no. <laughs> 
Yeah, I suspect you need these tools when you start getting something immensely complicated. Um, so we have another quasi quoter called SQL here, much like the text one that just um, that just lets you write multi line strings easier for the most part. Um, it does escape it. I don't think the quasi quoter is doing the escaping. Uh -huh. But the way they rates translate it into. Yeah, so our, our parameters here are just question marks. Mm -hmm. um, so does it mean it, it translates to Pascal or Yeah, quasi quotes is a feature of template Haskell, right? Pretty sure. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not the template Haskell extension per se, but I think it implies the template Haskell yeah. extension. Um, but I don't think template Haskell is what's doing the parameter substitution. I think that's just a library code that's constructing strings and making sure to escape the arguments properly. Um, the, the only reason that I sort of would like to look into something more sophisticated for generating these SQL queries is that uh, it does get hard when you have a number of parameters. It's the same c kind of complaint that you had before talking about the talking about the I and I parser, right? having a lot of positional arguments in a row. Um, you really got to be careful when you're writing these, right? That um, So these are the two arguments that correspond to these, that correspond to these two question marks, right? And so you got to make sure your arguments are in the right order, otherwise you're doing something terrible. I did, I did take the approach of defining a custom prelude for this project. Um, I'm, still, I'm still on the fence about whether that's a good idea or not. Um, so this is, we have, we have no implicit prelude, the GHC, GHC extension turned on by default, so we don't get the normal prelude, and then instead we, um, in, in each file, we start by importing our own prelude replacement module. Um, and in, the, in this case, my custom prelude is not too crazy. I just I import the normal prelude, um, excluding a couple of things. Um, in particular, it really kills me that log is a function prelude because I never want to write logarithms. However, I do want to talk about logs a lot. Uh, so I'd rather get that out of my default scope. Yeah, I don't have anything against the log, fun the logarithm function. Why do you hate logarithms? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then you know, head is a partial function that I don't need. However, I am building uh, web pages right that have a head and a body, and so I talk about head a lot. So really, I've only you know, I've only excluded not just the things that I dislike, but the things that I've actively run into conflicts with. Oh, I suppose I should show how I'm using Lucid too. So in cases where I'm building HTML manually, I'm um, not using any kind of template templating language for that, um, but I'm using this Lucid library, um, which lets you write Haskell code that just kind of looks like, I'm not going to say it looks like HTML, but you're uh, just defining the, the HTML DOM structure um, using this large, massive library where you have a function that's corresponding to each HTML um, element and attribute. Um, so you don't use a template? No, I don't. Um, 
I might consider using a template because Lucid has a major downside that it has vastly increased my compile time. Because mostly just because it has vastly increased the amount of Haskell code that there is, right? Um, there's there's a lot going on here as far as Haskell goes, so just to build a form, right? So. Um, but it is it does have the convenience of it's, it's very expressive it's very easier it's a lot easier to write uh, in my opinion to be able to just write everything in Haskell rather than have to having to think about going back and forth between Haskell and what variables need to get bound into a HTML template. And you could use all this console mod, right? All the what? You could use uh, you, you could use all this let's say console monad stuff like replicate or something. Mm, I don't. It's a monad, right? It is. It's a lot like writer, right? Each time you do something, you're adding. Mm. So you could use replicate or function match list. Oh, yes, I see what you're saying exactly. And you can use, uh, use things like. Um, Yeah, so like this, this describes uh, like on your account page your subscription status, right? And so there's different sections in here that I want to show or don't show depending on uh, the, your account state, right? And so um, like if you're not in the account renew state, then I want to show this paragraph that has a link to reactivate your subscription, right? And so yeah, this is the when um, I think from Monad or from Applicative or one of those. Right? Um, Yes. Okay. Um, well, I think I think this uh, this is the end of our time. So, thank you for sticking with me.